Okay. So the first thing that we need to do is if you all, I think most of you already have an account on Design Safe, uh, from what we saw in the poll. Uh, if you have not, uh, please create an account on Design Safe. Uh, when you run the simulations using our tool, you still use the Sim Center allocation rather than your allocation. So whatever resources you have will still be there. It will not be used. It'll be using the Sim Center allocation. I'll show you why uh, how that happens as well uh, as we go on. So if you're not registered, so if you go to the Design Safe page. I've posted the link. Uh, and it's a very short, uh, easy way to register. So they have a lot of information here, but uh, don't worry too much. I mean, uh, so we're basically trying to understand who are the people who are using Design Safe. What is it being used for? Uh, primarily to so that they have some metrics in order to uh, when they, when when this when NSF is funding the endeavor and they want to know who is using it and uh, are researchers from natural hazards really using it or is it somebody else using it to run some simulation? Okay. Uh, okay. I, okay. Somebody said that the notification that the account need one day to complete the whole process. Okay. That's, uh, I'm sorry to know that. Uh, let me just ask uh, if we can do something on that. Just give me one second. Uh, let me just copy paste your message to my colleague Matt who was here in the last session. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, AJ. Let me check with Design Safe and see if they can expedite it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I was uh, planning to just send you a message on Slack, but yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. Okay. So just uh, try create an account on Design Safe because you will need this to log in into our tool to submit any job. Uh, so let me just then go back, go to our tool. So that's what we want to try to do today and try to understand what the Hydro UQ is doing. So if you install something, you when you start it, probably this is the, uh, let's say what it looks like. I think probably for somebody on Windows, the font probably looks a little bad. Uh, I'm working on a style sheet. I designed this on a Mac and then didn't realize that it looks, uh, we have a style sheet, but somehow the elements that are looking bad were not there in the style sheet for the windows. So that's why it's looking a little bad, but I'll clean it up. Sorry about that. Uh, it looks a little bit bigger. So uh, that's it. But uh, I, I, don't, I didn't like how it looks, but I'll clean that up. So, but this is the general overview of what it looks like. Uh, so if you have to run a job, you'll have to uh, use this login button here. So there's a login button on the top right hand corner. So once you give login, uh, okay, I think I need to share the entire window in order to be able to show you these. Okay, let me just share the entire window. Okay. So I think, are you able to see my screen? Please let me know if you're not able to see the screen with has the hydro UQ window on it. Uh, so you need to log in. So when, once you press login, it asks you for the design safe user account information. So this is basically the username and uh, password that you created on design safe in order to log in. So that should uh, basically uh, give you a login. At the moment, there are a couple of pop-up boxes that are coming in. Uh, we have a version that is coming out next very soon in, a, in less than 15 days to a month that all these pop-up boxes will be gone. So uh, if you're getting annoyed with a lot of pop-ups that keep coming in, please don't worry. This is going to be, this already been rectified. It's just not in the uh, latest installer. So that's what I meant when, when I said that uh, the installer is slightly always behind the actual development version on the GitHub. Uh, so often there's, there are three, four buttons on the bottom. One is the exit, so which is pretty clear. Okay, we close the application, right? So I don't want to close the application or okay, if I exit, no, it basically closes the application, right? Um, so let me launch it again. So now there's something called a run button. So run is essentially to run your jobs locally. So once we set it up, but uh, at the moment it is going to give you an saying that it cannot be run locally. Uh, this, is, this was primarily done at the moment because uh, First, we were hoping that we would be running the jobs uh, on TAC and design safe because the CFD simulations take a long time. But uh, we also re recently also realized that uh, probably people might want to run, or even I would want to run a uh, few first few steps on my own local computer to test that everything is correct before I send it off and fire it out to design safe, right? So, uh, so this is something that is going to be coming back in the in the next uh, month and the next version. Sorry, I'm just trying to. 
put this in one place. Okay, so so that you can you'll be able to test the app locally and see that it runs and everything is working before you send it out to Design Safe. But this would also require you to install Python and also install the Open Form and so on. But we'll try to work it out and make sure that it works uh, so that you can test it locally. So the second button is Get from Design Safe. Okay, so it, I must log in. Sorry, so I must so let me log in back in. So when I do a get from design safe, I get a list of jobs that I have run on design safe, right? So these are all the jobs that have been run on design safe. For example, I can say, uh, for example, it's uh, now it says the job is finished, but if it was running or something, I can say refresh the job. So it will go back and find out what the status is. Since it is finished, it just shows, shows finished. Otherwise, it will uh, show that either you're staging a job or you're in the queue, which means that uh, you have submitted your job to HPC. For those who have already used uh, HPC sir, uh, clusters, you're probably very familiar with it. Uh, but for those who have not used it, so generally when you submit a job, it goes into a queue. So it's like, think of like, you know, you go to a grocery store, you're standing in a queue to pay your bill, right? So it's something very similar. So depending on how many processors you're asking, how much time you're asking, you can get a different priority in the queue. For example, some if you're asking for one processor, you might get the job much faster than somebody who's asking for a hundred processors, right? Uh, so if you're asking for one hour, you might get it much faster than if you're asking for 48 hours. One thing that we want to note here is the maximum runtime is 48 hours. So if you try to run for more than 48 hours, it is going to kill the job. So we want to be careful about it. But we also understand that the CFD simulations can take a long time. And we are try trying to work with stacks so that the job submitted through Hydro UQ would be automatically restarted after 48 hours so that it allows for longer jobs to be run up to like 120 hours or so, which is essentially five days, right? So one thing is you can refresh a job that gives you the status of the job. Second function is you can also delete the job and the data. So when you delete the job and data, it is also going to delete on design safe. So I'm going to show you where you can find this job on design safe and how to locate it. Right, because sometimes we don't. Uh, at the moment, we are only able to retrieve the structural results, but not the fluid results. We want to go to Design Safe to access that. At the moment, we will work. We are working on that as well. So you can do retrieve data. So what does retrieve data is going to do? It is going to go to uh, Design Safe and try to find all the information of the structural information that is there. So uh, we will talk about what this, uh, what I'm doing here, but okay, so I did some, some let's call magic, and there are some values that I'm getting, some kind of, uh, some numbers that are there. Okay, these numbers are really small because these were run for very small number of time steps. So essentially what you can get is like some kind of a probabilistic data or like a histograms that I was showing in which shows the structural response. I'm not going to talk about what this uh, results that you are seeing in is uh, because the one thing is because uh, Akash and Sangri will be touching upon what these histograms mean later in the day today. And also Quanshi would be talking about this thing about uh, what this means in terms of the structural results, right? So we'll leave it to them to explain you what these results mean. I will try to focus more on the CFD part of it because that's where the uh, most of the uh, interesting things and let's say complicated things and uh, are happening in there, right? So this is just to give you an idea of what is happening in this interface, what, what is it that we are seeing, what is get from design safe, what is run, what is exit. And last thing is run at design safe. So once you give run at design safe, what is happening, it is going to take all the data that you have populated in this UI and it is going to send it to design safe to start a job. Okay, so you can give the job a name. So for example, let's say, uh, if we take it from design safe. So for example, this is the name that I had given for the last job. It is new build five, you know? So uh, I, I mean, whenever I put five, my jobs were running. So I always put five these days somehow. So you can see afternoon five, evening five, evening six, Ajay five, you know? So it, jobs were running when I had a five in there, you know, just superstition, right? But I'm just joking, but uh, uh, <laughs> just to, uh, add some humor into it, but uh, yeah, you can give any name in there and that is what the name is going to show. First thing is going to show the name of the app and the name that you have given so that you can identify what job you are running, right? So second thing that goes in there when I give run from design safe is number of nodes and number of processors per node. So here it's important to note that you can have up to, you can go up to 64 processors per node, but I think the limit is 62 or something because it doesn't allow all the 64 to be used. So there are 64 processors on each node, but I think you can use up to 62 of them, 
right? So you can use the n number of nodes and in each of these nodes, you can access up to 62 processors. So this is the maximum runtime. So which means that after this much amount of runtime, so runtime does not start when you submit the job, runtime starts when the job starts to run. So, yeah. so there's a stage when it goes into the queue, it is waiting in the queue. And then like, you know, like, like you're in the grocery queue when the cashier comes in, that's when your time starts, you know? So until then you're like, somebody's taking a long time, you're looking at them, oh, they're taking so much time there, right? So then when you are there, then everybody's looking at you, how much time is this person taking, right? So, so it's like that. So your job time starts when it starts to run. And that is from where you're like, for example, if I put 48 hours for this job, that's from where the 48 hours starts to be counted. So we can use a maximum of 48 hours in order to run this job, uh, run any job, but that would be that is something a work in progress. We'll try to increase it to 120 hours, or try to restart our jobs and so on and so forth. On the left, left panel, there are several things. So you now you know how to run a job. So you know, change these things, put number of processes you want, send it to run, and you know, everything is working fine, right? So there are some number of jobs, a number of things here. I will just briefly uh, talk about them, but I will leave some of these tabs to Akash, Sangri, and Quanshi, right? So first thing is the UQ tab. So this is nothing but the uncertainty quantification. Or in other words, what is the uncertainty quantification method that I want to use? At the moment, there's only one engine that is the Dakota engine that we can use. So maybe I can just share back just the window so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, Okay, so let me just go back to share this. So there's only the Dakota engine that is available at the moment that we can use. Uh, so Akash and Sangri are working on our own uh, UQ engines, which brings in new methods that are not available there in the Dakota. So Dakota is a, uh, uh, let's say a software that was developed at the Sandia National Labs to do these kind of methods. So there are three different forward propagation, sensitivity and reliability analysis. And uh, you can either execute in parallel or in serial and so on and so forth. I think this is something that we will be talking today afternoon. I think the last session, Sangri and Akash will be going into the details, talking about what all these methods are, Monte Carlo, Gaussian process. I mean, I don't know any of them, right? So I'm not the expert on the UQ thing. I barely understand it. So I would, I'm just using whatever they're doing and saying that they, they tell me that this works. So I think, okay, that works, right? So. So, but I, I am also interested in understanding what is happening in there. So let's let's wait for them to uh, tell us what is uh, what what this UQ engine is doing and how it is working there. So second tab comes out to be your general information. So this is a, essentially an info, uh, information about your building. So one of the limitations of the hydro UQ that we are still working and uh, this is something that also I would put it back to you as a user is what do you want to do, right? So a hydro UQ allows for you to get the response on one particular building. So now think of your coastal uh, region. So think of a beach and you know so some kind of a high rise buildings around it. Like for example, Asia, right? And uh, you can choose one of these buildings on which you can get the response. Let's say if I have 20 buildings, I cannot get the response on all the 20 buildings, but only on one of the buildings. I can still have these 20 other buildings because they influence the flow around this one building that I am interested in or we are interested in, right? So of course, this is something that I, again, if somebody is interested in doing multiple buildings at the same time, please come back to, uh, please go on the user forum and write a user request saying, hey, I want to do 20 buildings and we get response on 20 buildings. Can you put something for the Hydro UQ? Uh, that is something that we can, you know, work with it and uh, we can see how that can be added. But at the moment you can get response on one of the one building and, but then you can have a lot of other buildings around it. So this GI has the information about this one building that we are interested in and trying to under, get the structural response on. So essentially this has the information about the number of stories in the building. What is the height of this building? So this, uh, for example, I mean, you might be wondering, okay, this guy says one meter building. So what's the one meter building with three stories, right? So this, this, is, this was set up for uh, the one, the job that I just pulled in with all the information was set up for a wave flume experiment where we had a scaled down model of the building. So the building is not really one meter, but it's just a scaled down model that we are looking at. So the, this, what is the height of this building? So that's the height. Uh, so what is the depth? The depth is often, we are considering that in the direction of the flow. Okay, so, and what is the width of this building? So width into depth somehow gives you the plan area in a way. And second thing is the location. Where is this building location? So for example, if you're thinking of a bathymetry and if you're thinking of a jar, jar uh, let's say, 
of actual uh, ge geographical location, then we have like a longitude and latitude to locate the building. But we can also be simulating some kind of a experiment in a wave flume where we don't really have a latitude and a longitude for the scaled down buildings. We have X and Y. So then essentially latitude and longitude are nothing but X and Y. And uh, so that, that's where you give your X and Y information. Okay, so this is the information about the building on which we are interested in trying to get the structural response. The third tab essentially is the simulation tab. So this is where Quanchi is going to go in a lot of detail tomorrow, where he's going to talk about the MDOF model, which is probably if you've taken a dynamics and vibration class, you would have done the single degree of freedom, two degree of freedom, multi degree of freedom as such. So how do you have this multi uh, single degree of freedom or a multi degree of freedom model in there? And so there basically there are different things like floor weights and so on and so forth. Uh, Okay, so there's a small bug here that we noticed yesterday that when you load that this is not loading the correct value, but always load the default value, uh, something that we'll be fixing up soon. Uh, or you can just give an open C script. So this is like, this was, a, I felt like this was an enigma for people who might not have used open script. And so I, I asked Quan Chi if he can go into detail on how to prepare the script. So in tomorrow's session, we'll be talk he'll be talking about how do I prepare the script and what happens in the script and what is there in the script, what is the information that is coming out in the script and so on and so forth. So this is something that we will be talking about later in uh, tomorrow's session, Quan Chi would be addressing this aspect of uh, how, how do you uh, prepare the script and what is going on in the script and so on and so forth, right? So I'll leave it to him for now. Uh, and I'll say that, okay, this is, let's say, assume for now that's in the black box. We don't want to worry too much about it. Let's just use the MDOF model that we are probably more familiar with, right? So as soon as you say select MDOF, it automatically populates with a lot of different uh, uh, default information uh, that is there. But again, you as an engineer or uh, who is a, as a researcher will have to think about what information do I need to give in here? What are the numbers that I need to use? So the nice thing is, for example, let's say, for example, we were talking about UQ here, right? So let's say, for example, I'm saying my floor stiffness in the Y direction is some value of 100, right? So what is, the, I don't know this thing, right? You know, I, I say, okay, I don't know more what my what is this. Let me say it's a Y, right? And I don't really know it. So what this is going to automatically create is a random variable called Y. So you can select different distributions for this and assign a mean and a uh, you know, standard deviation. Let's say 100, for 100 probably a man standard deviation of five gives you how, it, how the probability distribution looks like. So it is basically going to give you some different distribution that you can probably choose in and uh, uh, maybe log normal, for example, let's say 106 or something like that. So it kind of gives you these distributions that are there. So now instead of saying my Y is like a value of 100, I am saying that my y is not a single value, but it has a probabilistic distribution of the, with this mean and variance. Now I'm automatically introducing some, uh, some of these uncertainties in my structural model, right? So essentially when I do the simulation now, my structural response is not, okay, there's a deformation of 0 0.1 meters, but it says, okay, there's a structural deformation of 0 0.1 meters plus or minus something, or this is the, probabilistic distribution of your structural response. So the high probability, what does this mean? There's a high probability of this being, let's say the deformation being 0.1 meters, there's a probably a low probability of this being 0 0.01 meters, but there's still some probability, maybe 1% chance of it. So that helps us evaluate what's the probability of a, a certain event happening. What's the probability that a building uh, would, uh, let's say, uh, survive, uh, let's say a tsunami kind of an event or storm surge kind of an event or uh, what is the, uh, or like some kind of a wall that's not going to go down and things like that, right? So that gives us the uncertainty event of it. So uh, I'll, again, Quanchi would be going in, Quanchi and Akash and Sangri would be going into the details. So I leave it to them, but I just wanted to make sure that you have a holistic idea of what is happening here. So the next tab is the finite element tab where we are uh, giving the information about what are the solvers that are coming in there, what solver do you want to use? Do you want to use a newton raphson solver? Do you want to use a, uh, like, let's say, a, uh, what are, uh, any or some other solver and so on and so forth. And I'll, I'll again leave this to Quan Chi, who will be talking about the finite elements and the EDP parameters, the engineering uh, demand parameters and so on. And already we talked about the RV and the UQ tab, which is Akash and Sangri is going to talk about later in the last session today after lunch. The only last thing that is left out in the research, uh, sorry, uh, results, 
So as you see, when I said get from design safe and try to get the data from there, we were able to populate these uh, responses here. And again, uh, Akash and Sangri will say, tell you what these results look like and what this mean in a way, right? Uh, so I, I'll again leave it to them. So essentially, this is the results tab. So we have a UQ tab, which is talking about, uh, which is helping you set up the uncertainty quantification methods. GI tab, general information, which is help, uh, which is basically the information about the building on which we are interested in the response. Now, if you want to have multiple buildings, please go to the forum and let us know about that. And that's kind of, let's say, so because NSF says this is what you can do because based on what we have told them that we will do, NF says, NFS look, NSF looks that, are we doing that? Now, if there's a user request, if there's a user says, hey, this is what I want, I would like to do, can you help me with it? That is our justification to NSF that why we did what we did, uh, which might not already be in our original proposal in a way. So that's the reason why we encourage our users to try to write on the forum and say that, hey, I want to do this thing. You know? Right. The third thing is the simulation tab where we are trying to give the model generator. What is the building model? What's kind of a, what, uh, how, how do we define this building model and so on? The fourth one, I mean, the fifth one is the finite element. The fourth one is the event. So that's our CFD event. I'll come to that. A finite element, engineering demand parameters, random variables, where we're defining all the random variables. What is the probabilistic distribution of these? And lastly, the results that we are getting, which is this uh, probabilistic structural response. So that one building that you put in the general information, what is the structural response that you got of this building? So what is the probability of it, right? So, uh, last but never the least, I kept the event for the last because that is where we are going to focus a lot on, right? So one thing that I, when I was, when I was building, I didn't think about it uh, was that uh, for, for this is, okay. If somebody, if you had just loaded it, uh, without me doing the let me let me just exit and come back so you see how it looks like when i when you just first load it right so let's let's try to do that because when when i got the results back i populated it with some data and uh, okay somebody is not able to log in so let's see if matt is around okay yeah, AJ, they uh, Design Safe does a manual um, account authorization, so okay. they no, doesn't happen wait. automatically. I'm trying to see if we can get those expedited, but um, it's a process, right? Okay, uh, Abin, can you probably send the information, maybe about your username or some uh, email address to Matt, who is also on the? I think you should be able to send it via chat. You can send it to him via a private message. And probably he can try to follow up with the design safe to see if he can uh, expedite your approval in a way. So like he said, it has to be manually done. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so coming back to the event. So the most important thing is that we are looking at the CFD. And like I was saying, a uh, finite element is sometimes very forgiving when uh, you put in something, you get out something, we don't know if it's correct or not, that's a different question, but it at least spits out something, right? So that's, so when we come from a structural engineering background, kind of it, uh, it's a nice thing to have, but CFD might not always be that much forgiving when we are looking at things. It is like saying, oh, hey, you didn't give the right, right thing, you know? So it's not my problem, it's your problem, right? So, so that can be really frustrating when you get started with the CFD simulation, you get these cryptic messages from open form so, and you really don't know what is happening. There's some good uh, uh, user base there, but uh, so kind of that's, that's kind of where I want to say that if you get any error, come to the forum, just put it out there, I'm there to help you with, right? Uh, you, so one thing that I didn't realize was uh, you, people might have started and tried to open this thing and nothing is happening here, right? So when you try to single click or double click, nothing happens. Uh, I didn't think about this when I was building. So that's what uh, probably happens like when, when you get a tunnel vision and you're looking at your software and you have an idea of how it should be. And then people said, okay, hey, this can be really frustrating because I don't know how to go about it, right? So there are two things here. One is the event type. For now, it's called a general event, which is essentially having every kind of thing. So whatever you want to do, everything about the CFD event is available in this general thing. So we will kind of have different events in there. So, and there's something called a si simulation type. And the simulation type, essentially, if you look at it, has four different things at the moment. We are trying to work on uh, new things, for example, something like a sim center library, where, for example, at the moment, now if you have a shallow water solver solution, you need to bring it in order to put it into the hydro UQ. 
but not everybody might want to run a shallow water solver, but might want to pick up a result that is already existing there and try to use with it. Uh, in that case, uh, we want to have some kind of sim center library where you can say, hey, I want to have an earthquake on this particular fault and this is the location that I want to look at. And can you, you know, uh, bring in the shallow water solutions for me instead? So we are working on something like that that would uh, be there in the next couple of versions and uh, I should be able to use it. But for now, there are four different kinds. One is to resolve a shallow water. So, so this was what we have been talking in the last session where we have a shallow water solution like the, what we saw as an earthquake on Alaska fault coming all the way to Crescent City or Hawaii. And then we want to do a small CFD simulation on this particular community that is there uh, near the coast and try to see what would be the structural response uh, and things like that. Right. And uh, so that, that is what the simulation type is. What do you want to do? What is your information? What's the, what are you bringing in? And what do you want to do with it? Right. So here it says CFD to resolve shallow waters. In other words, I have a shallow water solutions and I want to resolve some particular domain using CFD. Right. The second thing is using a bathymetry data. For example, I might not have the shallow water solutions completely but I might have some kind of a bathymetric data, right? Why, what, what do I mean by bathymetric data? That is nothing but our ocean floor data, topography or bathymetry essentially like, you know, where is our ocean floor, uh, right? And I have this data and I want to somehow use this data to create my CFD simulation. I don't have a shallow water, but I have this bathymetry somehow, you know, there are a lot of websites where you go and say, hey, I, I uh, you know, extract bathymetry and then you can select point one and point two, get a, a square or a, a rectangle, and it's going to give you this data. There are also websites on NOAA and things like that, which gives you this data. Essentially, this is basically like a, a crudely like a, a CSV file of X comma Y comma Z, where X and Y are the location of the points and Y is at Z is nothing but the depth, right? Okay, so are there any questions so far? Okay, okay, so uh, hopefully you'll have more questions as we go on. So third thing is essentially, I might not have the bathymetry data, this is slightly get, I'm trying to more generalize it. I have a STL file. So most often CFD softwares like to have STL files or these are something like a, a triangulated surface, right? And we want to have this STL file and then we want to run a CFD simulation. Somehow I have generated an STL file. For example, one of the things that we will do today or try to at least do today with the Jupyter Notebook, which I'll leave it to you. If you don't finish, it's like a homework uh, before tomorrow, I'll give you the solutions. I mean, uh, is that try to, uh, to read the shallow water solver solutions and try to create a STL file of the bathymetry and, you know, and a domain so we can use it to do the simulation. I mean, uh, I'm just having this Jupyter notebooks as an exercise because that is what is happening on the back end of the hydro UQ. So when you bring in a shallow water results, what is hydro UQ doing? I just want to give you a glimpse of it. Uh, so that's what it's doing. It's basically taking your solutions, taking your bathymetry and converting it to some kind of an STL file. And this STL file is used to do the meshing and to set up the CFD simulation, right? And the, sorry about that. And the last uh, type of uh, simulation that we have is uh, called a wave flume digital twin. So the wave flume digital twin helps you set up a wave flume very easily. So we are going to talk about the digital twin tomorrow. So I'm not going to touch it today. We will try to see the other three today and tomorrow uh, we'll have the wave flume as well. And we'll also try to run and uh, run these simulations if you are not able to do them today. Right. So there are three turbulence models. At the moment for the workshop, I've disabled the K epsilon and K omega SST. And uh, some of you who might be coming from the fluids mechanics background would say, hey, turbulence is an important aspect. How can you just say the flow is laminar? I mean, the flow is not laminar, flow is definitely turbulent. But why have I uh, disabled that is uh, to focus on the lamin, keeping it laminar, right? So what we are doing here is a RANS simulation, Reynolds average in Navier Stokes. We're not doing an LES simulation like a large JD simulation or a DNS simulation. So we are doing a RAN simulation. So when we are running these the RAN simulation, what happens is we have these wall models. So I, I'm trying to explain turbulence, which is a, let's say an advanced fluid, advanced uh, graduate course on itself, trying to explain that in uh, two minutes. So um, 
probably please excuse me if I'm not 100% technically correct, right? So I'm trying to make it as simple to understand there. So what happens, for example, when you're looking at these uh, flows, you know, let's say you have some kind of a wall, which is essentially our bottom surface or our bathymetry. Now a flow is happening over that. I can say that the velocity at the wall of the fluid is zero. It is, let's say it's sticking to this wall. So there's no slip or it's sticking to the wall. So velocity at that point is zero. But then very near to the wall, the velocity continuously changes. There's a lot of turbulence happening there, right? So looking into the turbulence in the hydrodynamics, there's a whole community of fluid mechanicians who are doing that. And uh, uh, that's, that's a completely in, a topic in itself. Uh, but why am I not uh, in a, giving you the turbulence model for the workshop? But like, let's say, once you go out of the workshop and try to use the actual version, you'll probably get the turbulence model and everything. But uh, to, uh, why we are not using the turbulence model is essentially when you look at open foam, this is essentially like selecting an option. I select K epsilon and then I'm done. I'm not doing anything else. No other inputs are going in from my side with regard to the turbulence model. And so it is just selecting a particular uh, thing and then leaving it there. So even though it's an important aspect, as long as we start with a reasonable wall model, uh, I think the results should be acceptable, I would say, right? So of course, there are a lot of other things that influence a CFD simulation, like the mesh, the boundary conditions, and so on. And turbulence wall model is one of the things. So very near to this wall, uh, the fluid flow is, uh, let's say, approximated using these wall models. So instead of uh, doing a full 3D DNS simulation, you're approximating them using these small wall models that can be done. So that is the reason why uh, uh, I'm saying that you just select one of these and probably you're done with it. So we'll not focus on that uh, quite uh, extensively. Uh, but if somebody is interested in uh, looking at hydrodynamics turbulence itself, then I'm happy to discuss with you and we can try to see uh, if, you, if we can include more tur uh, turbulence models that can help your work or we can uh, try to allow for a researcher module where you will say, hey, I bring in my own turbulence model to run it, right? So we can look into, look into these things if you're interested. So it's important to select one of these simulation options before you can access any of the things on the data on the table on the left. For example, now I've selected shallow water to resolve uh, CFD to resolve shallow waters. If I go to the bathymetry, something happened, something changed, right? Something came on the right hand side. But now if I go and say, right, two simulation type, which is basically not selected anything, then how much ever I click on the left side, nothing is going to happen, right? So essentially, the, that's, that's the, that is why you're probably getting stuck if you have clicked a few times and nothing happened. That is the thing. And uh, that's like, you know, a, uh, like a developer's tunnel vision, like so that, that needs to be cleaned up for sure. And I'm also thinking of a better way to put it so that uh, uh, users don't have the frustration of clicking and nothing happening in there, right? Uh, but now, now you know how to get these things activated. So first thing is the uh, CFD to uh, sh resolve the shallow waters, right? So for example, let's say if you double click, uh, uh, single click on any of these things with the arrow on the left, it is just going to like, you know, pull, pull them down. But uh, double clicking on some of these events will probably change something there that we can, you know, uh, uh, doing. Uh, okay, there, there's something happening in there, right? So let's try to understand what these some things are, and we will try to see what can what what inputs we need to give in there in order to be able to see do the CFD uh, simulations and set them up in there. Okay. Uh, so first thing is like, for example, the project name and project description. This is primarily for uh, let's say our reference when we. Uh, um, this project name and the one that you give at runner design safe uh, need not be the same. They're somehow unfortunately not yet connected. They need to be connected. Uh, so this is just basically uh, what happens is you will see that uh, everything is generated into a JSON file. So whatever information that you have in this UI goes into a JSON format, JSON. And uh, there we will have this project name and project description. This has nothing to do more than the value that uh, if you open the file, you understand uh, what you have, what you are doing, and what you are trying to do. And it has no more uh, value than that, right? So now let's go to the bathymetry. So bathymetry essentially. So in the geometry, we have three different things. One is our bathymetry. One is our shallow water to CFD interface, and last one is our building. Okay, so we have, uh, so three different things are there. 
So first thing is the bathymetry. So for, you can just select the bathymetry and select the different bathymetry files that you already might have. Uh, and okay, it's going to give you an error if you don't select anything or warning at least. And similarly, you can select the CFD solution files. So here it's going to read the first bathymetry file only. So only one file is going to be read and you can have multiple CFD, uh, multiple solutions that you are selecting in there. So let me just uh, uh, go to our GitHub account just to sh uh, share with you uh, or the GitHub one that I just uh, sent the link. Uh, copy. Okay, so this is the GitHub uh, that I shared saying Hydro uh, Tool Training 01. I just put Lab 01 where I would just put all the files. So now if you go to Lab 01, you'll be able to find a, a folder called GeoClaw. And there's also a, a Ike uh, 80 frames. So this is a storm search simulation done by uh, my REU student, Claire, who, who is really smart and doing a lot of these GeoClaw simulations. And she's trying to do this, like I was saying, she's trying to do this compression for, that can be, that almost brings down two GB data into 20 MB, right? So uh, so she was the one who did this simulation. So I have to give her the credit for it. And uh, so I'm basically, so the, all the 80 frames are available in this zip file, but I've just chosen 10 of them in order to uh, make sure that we don't uh, run our uh, Jupyter notebooks for eternity or like, you know, really long time, but they can be read. So the shallow water sol solver or GeoClaw is giving two sets of uh, uh, outputs here. One is the fort.t and one is the fort.q, right? So 0001002 is somehow representing your time step and uh, the, okay, the files are too large, okay, to open up. So for example, then now let's say there are two of these files. One is the fort.t, one is the fort.q. Right. So if I open the fort dot t anytime, so it basically has uh, six informations here, uh, six uh, of them. So one is the time. So this is the time at which the simulation is being run. So then there are like uh, four equations. So for example, we'll see four columns in the uh, output file. Uh, then there are a nine grids. So we'll talk about what these grids are and uh, in dim in dimension two dimensional and so that these are something of our interest. Right. So there's a couple of other things uh, which we'll not worry for now. Most important thing is how many grids are there n grids, and how what is the how many dimensions are there? It's a two dimension thing. It's a x and y, and uh, what is the time? Right. So now I have opened port zero 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 seven. Let me open port zero 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 five. Right. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Q dot zero 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 seven. So I have opened port t dot zero 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 seven and fort.q.0007. So it's not going to render it, so I have to view it as raw. Uh, so as you see here, it says a grid number, right? So let's try to search how many grid numbers are there. So if you look at it, it can, would somebody guess how many grid numbers might we have? So we have one. So if you look at it, we found nine grid numbers here, right? Two of nine. If I go back to my fort, I see that there are nine grids that are available. So what is GeoClaw doing? If you are, if you remember seeing this video that we had, we had this uh, simulation that was running from Alaska to uh, to the uh, to California and Hawaii, but somewhere near Crescent City, these uh, grids were much 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 finer than what they were overall, right? So GeoClaw is doing uh, adaptive mesh refinement really nicely. So each of these grids represent the smaller uh, refined grids in a way, right? And uh, what are we getting? So essentially here, X low, Y low, DX, DY, MX and MY. So what does it say? It says that X low, like for example, let's say, if we go to our, uh, uh, let's say, let's go to our documentation. So let's go to the Hydro YouTube page. I'm trying to connect the documentation so you are able to find the information wherever, whenever required and uh, try to be able to relate to the uh, material that we already have to the one that we are discussing and what the tool is showing as well, right? So if you look at our grid, so if you think, or if you think of our grid is uh, located in a, 
x y z uh, like a nice regular grid you could see everything was like a nice square uh, that, that was cut into smaller squares and so on right so it looked really nice or smaller rectangles and so on so here x low would represent our lowermost point here right so that is the point at our i think southwest point and dx represents our mx here so what what did we have here so we had our x low y low so x low y low if you take this grid that we have it is the lowermost point or the southwest southwest point dx is the uh, let's say the uh, dimension of the cell in the x direction dy is the that in the y direction and mx is how many do we have in the x and how many do we have in the y right so you eventually we will find here that we have mx into my entry so we have mx into my entries so i think if you look at it so we have i think 30 entries here so if you we can just copy paste this into a file to just verify that right so let's open that let me let me just share again So if you look at it, I just copy pasted whatever we had in that other file. So if you look at it, we had 30 entries here. So from the from our previous file, I just copied one block that was basically said MX is 30. So we have basically it's going along the X direction. So it's basically starting along the X direction from the northwest point. It goes MX number of points, then MY number of, uh, again, like MX then comes to the next level of Y. Mx, then again comes to the next level of y, mx. So you have my blocks of mx chunks of information. So this is what is available, let's say, in our geoclaw solution. So when we, uh, when we are trying to uh, look at this information and trying to extract something from there. Okay. So yeah, so we're back on this page. Right? So that is what our topography is kind of saying, or there are different kinds of topography available. And uh, so, I mean, this solution has nothing to do with the topography, but also kind of uh, uh, gives you some pictorial descriptions of how the uh, information is arranged in a particular way, right? So, uh, so there are nine grids, as we saw that Fort T says how many grids we have, and Fort Q has the, all the information at all these grids. Okay, so at different grid levels, so let's say grid number one, grid number two, so there's nine grids up to grid number nine, you can find this information. And we have four columns here, right? So what are, what are these four columns? Uh, can somebody think, guess, give a guess? Okay, so four columns essentially represent, first represent the height of the water. So when the height of the water is zero, what we have essentially here is nothing but our bathymetry. The fourth column is nothing but our bathymetry whenever the height of the water is zero. So otherwise, essentially the fourth column would represent what we call as a eta, which is a variable, which is nothing but the height of the water column plus the bathymetry. Okay. So the uh, column two represents our X momentum. If you saw, we had a variable like something like H into U bar, which is like something like our X momentum. And the third column is nothing but our Y momentum, which is something like H into V bar, right? So this is what the GeoClaw information is. So why am I going into GeoClaw? Because we want to understand what is the information that we are feeding into hydro U -Q. So that is the, this, is, this is what I meant when we say we are selling, sending these solution files. Right? So there are two formats. Let me go back to the Hydro UQ interface. Okay. So now we have two kinds of format. One is saying what is the SimCent of what is the format of the bathymetry, and what is the format of the solution. At the moment, the GeoClaw solution format and the SimCenter Type One solution format are GeoClaw Type One and the uh, SimCenter formats are the same. So when I say type one, I'm essentially, what, what do we have? We have a whole bunch of X comma Y, X, Y, and Z uh, tab separated CSV file. 
So that is essentially what we are trying to use for our uh, bathymetry here uh, in our is the, uh, as a sim center format. And uh, again, the geoclass format and solution format and sim center solution formats are the same. So they don't uh, really make a difference, but we are again working out to see what would be the best sim center format that can be more universal in a way, right? So here you can just select your bathymetry file, which is an XYZ file of all the equal points. So you have your bathymetry at each point, you have X, Y, and what's the depth, which is the Z. And so you, you have that. And then you also have the solution that you have already run from the geo club. If you go back to our repo, you'll find that we already have these uh, GeoClaw solutions from Ike that has been run and I've put them in the, all the 80 frames I'm sharing there. Uh, only thing that is, uh, I've separated like 10 of these files into a GeoClaw folder in order to be able to run our simulations because uh, passing all the 80 files might take up too much time and space. So we are just trying to parse some of them and uh, see how to work with. And second thing that, uh, as I said, uh, to be important here is that we need to be uh, think about the domain size, all right? So let me just uh, try to uh, write uh, here so it's more easier to understand. Okay, so now think of the simple uh, simulation. So now let's say this is our California coast. Somehow I'm, I'm, I'm very, very bad at drawing. So now we had a geoclass simulation that uh, ran that with the domain of this particular nature. Now I can take the entire domain and try to run a CFD simulation, but that's probably going to be really, really costly, right? So if I could run a CFD simulation for such a large domain, why do I want to do a uh, see a shallow water solution, right? So, because shallow water solution might be much more faster, reasonably accurate enough, and could give me as much information as a CFD on such a large domain. And I can't run a CFD simulation on such a large domain, right? So, essentially, I don't want to do the entire uh, domain, but I want to probably take a very small community here, uh, probably uh, which has like some. Uh, uh, where there could be some high rise structures or some important critical infrastructure. And I want to look at that, right? So this is my domain of interest that I am interested in, right? And the first thing is we want to somehow define these boundaries, right? So even though this is our shallow water domain, let's say shallow water domain. And uh, let's say this is nothing but our CFD domain. Uh, my CFD domains are going to be much, much, much smaller than what the shallow water can solve. So I need to be very critical about what I can take. Second thing is, since my domain is so small, right? So my domain is really small. So let me try to enlarge and write that here. So let's say, so this is our CFD domain. So let's say we try to enlarge it and write it here. Okay. So now I can think, I can assume that, okay, on the left side is I have some, so this is my domain. I have some buildings here. Let's say, let's say there's some buildings around here. And there's a particular coast somewhere, coastline here. So let's say this represents our buildings. And this represents our coastline. And this is our shallow water domain. Right? So now we want to be able to put all of this information in there. But at the same time, like I was saying, you have a wave that is propagating. So let's assume that our wave is propagating in this particular direction, right? So it's going to propagate in this particular direction. Then that means that it's going to hit this boundary maybe, and then it's, it's going to reflect it. Or probably, you know, the wave might even hit this boundary, and there's a chances of it being reflected. So how much time could it take for this physical reflection to come back to the original domain from which there's an inlet? Okay. So when we are doing CFD, we are thinking of things like, okay, there's an inlet, there's an outlet, and there's a wall. So three things, uh, uh, three standard things, there's an inlet, there's an outlet, and there's a wall, right? 
So what do I mean by a wall? Wall is something that we were discussing where you know the velocity of the water is uh, zero. Velocity is zero. Okay. So there's no slip. So there's uh, the fluid at the wall has a zero velocity. So the second thing is an inlet. So inlet, I generally assume there's some velocity of the fluid and it is coming into the domain. An outlet is something I'll assume that it's going outside the domain, you know, so going from inside to the outside of the domain, coming from inside to outside of the domain, right? So, sorry, outlet is going from inside to outside, and inlet is from outside to inside, right? So, this is so just, just like a crude definition of what an inlet and outlet might be. So, if we think of this shallow water that is coming in, and it we are having like a reflection we need to be sure, let's say crudely to think of it like in a continuum mechanics point of view, let's say if this distance was D and I was you know, going on a scooter on a bike or something, and I was going with a velocity of U, then the total time that I would need is what something like you know, uh, D by U, right? So to travel this distance, so this is D, so this will probably be 2D. So if cru crudely thinking of it, if the wave was going at some velocity and coming back, then you, this is the maximum time you can simulate. So you have a limitation that you need to think about that relates your domain size to the how much time you can simulate. So for example, we were looking at the uh, times that are there in the geoclass simulation, right? So you need to, be, uh, that, that gives you an idea of how many solution files do I need to upload in order to run this simulation. Right? You can upload a lot of solution files. So we're going to parse through them and everything. But at the end of the day, you might run a CFD simulation for 100 seconds. But if in the 100 seconds, you would have 100 reflection, then pretty much everything is wrong that you're getting. You need to think about how much time will it take for it to go to one end and come back to come back. And then how, how do you be able to uh, take care of this? So this is a very critical issue that I want to stress upon to keep in mind uh, when you're trying to do these uh, simulations. Or how much time do I take for it to for the wave to come back? Because like I said, you this is an inlet. So shallow water, it's going from the shallow water domain to the CFD domain. But there's no outlet at the same point from a CFD domain into a shallow water domain, right? So generally when you do a two-way coupling, both of these are there. And this accounts for the conservation of mass and momentum and things like that. But here, it's uh, since you have a one-way coupling in, you only have fluid coming in from the shallow water to the CFD, but not the other way. This kind of creates a problem that you need to be aware of the um, uh, the sizes of the domain that you are looking at, right? Now, going back at it, so there's a second thing that we are uh, going back, let's say, uh, to our hydro UQ. Sorry that I'm going back and forth between a couple of things. I, I, I did not want to have screenshots on a presentation because that can be super boring. And I'm, I somehow more prefer to write and then show a presentation and have things marked on them, right? So uh, second thing is the shallow water to CFD interface. So since we said that we want to take our shallow water solutions and we want to refine it, all right, and, uh, and uh, get, a bit, get some results at, uh, at particular areas with the CFD, we have to define some kind of an interface. Right. So when we looked at, uh, we said we had this uh, whole big uh, green color thing, and then we defined a small, so it's a whole big white color thing, and then we defined a small green box, which we said is our domain. So that's what we are doing here. So let me just go back to our documentation to show you how to how these uh, files should be. It is super simple and just four lines. So the interface, I, I, we thought about it quite a bit, and at the moment it is only four lines. Of course, there's some bit of, uh, 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 let's say, potential for improvement there. Uh, and we need to think about how to do that for sure. Yeah, so if you go to our uh, documentation in the user guide, user guide has basically the information about each of these uh, uh, widgets that we have in the app and what they're doing and what is the information that you need to put in and so on. So if you come to the geometry, you have the shallow water to see the interface. And there is something that, uh, uh, we can see what do what do we need to do? What is the CSV file that we need to put? In? So the CSV file just has uh, four lines. Each line has about five entries. Okay. So now we need to somehow say uh, tell our uh, open form 
what our boundaries are. Okay, sorry, I, I thought I was sharing the screen. Sorry, let me. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I thought I was sharing it somehow. I think it probably dropped. Or, okay. So if you come to the uh, Sim Center documentation, in the user manual, there's a hydro events. And in the hydro events, you can find. Uh, something called geometry. And in geometry, we can find shallow water or CSW, CFD interface, shallow water to CFD interface. So there again, like, like I said, your typical interface file only has five lines or it is the interface file and it, and it only has uh, four lines and five entries per line, okay? So we need to somehow tell our CF, uh, CFD software, what are the, uh, our boundaries? It is not going to automatically, like in our finite element, we have to say, hey, here's uh, my, this, this, these nodes are fixed. I'm applying a load on this node. I'm going to apply some torsion here and so on and so forth. Similarly, in our CFD simulation as well, we need to tell them what are the boundary conditions that we have, right? So that is the entry, exit, right, and left is our boundaries as such. So let, let's try to write down and try to see what these boundaries are like and why are we putting it in this particular format, right? So. Oh, where did it go? Okay, so now what we have is, let's say we have our domain. So this is our, I'm just trying to put everything into a square uh, just so that it's easy to visualize. And now we have our building here. So let me just color code the building. So this is our building here. So you have a, so there's some flow that is happening. So what are we interested in? So we are interested in what the flow around the building, right? And we are trying to uh, interested in what are the forces of this flow onto this building, right? So there's also flow separation and turbulence and so on. And what is the force coming on this building? And because of this, what, what is happening here, we can think of this like an external flow. It's a flow around something. Right. So, for example, it can there can be a flow inside a pipe, like an internal flow, or this external flow around the building. So, we can define a box around this building. So, if I had a box, if I had a building, then I, I can define a box around it. So, I can just uh, let's say if I was put, to put it into a three-dimensional sense, I can put it everything into a box. Right. So, there's a box inside this box. There's a building. So, it's like a vertical building in the box. Right. And uh, now, essentially, I can say one of this is my entry, one of this is my exit. So I have a flow coming in from one side. I call this as entry. I have flow going out from one side. I call it as exit. I mean, it can be anything. You know, you can call uh, you know uh, exit as the entry and entry as the exit. Nobody cares as long as just we follow a particular convention. Then I have a bottom floor. So this is my floor, right? So where I have, let's say this is my ocean floor, I call this as bottom. And then I have my atmosphere here. I call this as top. Okay, so now if I'm standing at the entry and looking towards the exit, then whatever is on the right side, I call it as a right and what's on the left side, I call it as a left. So what I've done is I've taken my bathymetry, I, that's like a latitude and longitude. I've taken a small domain out of this shallow water. And now I constructed like a 3D piece out of it. Like, you know, like think of it like extruding it. So I have a 3D box around my building of interest or buildings that are there uh, or area around which I want to do my flow simulation. So I'm doing setting up everything in a CFD in a box, right? So now, so when I'm looking at from the entry to the exit, what I have here, is basically my right face. And on the other side, I have my left face. I mean, this is just a convention that I have followed in the hydro UQ just to uh, make it more intuitive that we are looking at looking at the flow in the direction of the flow. And that is the, at, at the end, I have the exit. At the start, I have the entry. On the right, I have right. On the left, I have left. On the bottom, the floor is the bottom. I call it on the top atmosphere, I call it top, right? So that is the exact thing that you saw in our interface file. If you saw, if you remember, if you go back to the web page also, you can see that it says entry one zero one one exit 
zero one zero zero or something like that, right? So what is this saying here? It is saying now. It is giving. Let me let me say, try to use a different color here. Maybe let's say no, not red. Maybe not green. Let's say blue. Okay. So now our shallow water solver is like a two D domain, right? So essentially, we we have x and y only in there. Of course, we have the z, but we have average over the z. So we have x and y. So now, if I can think of my domain, and I can kind of split it into four points, you know, right? So this is my. I have a larger domain as well outside. I have a larger domain as well, but then out of that, I've chosen a smaller domain. I'm trying to uniquely define the smaller domain, and how am I doing this? I'm do, I'm doing this by choosing a square or a rectangle. So I'm basically trying to cut down all of these bigger bigger domain into smaller domain, and I'm trying to take bigger squares into smaller squares. So I I can easily define everything around it, and I can define patches around it. So I'm saying one of these is the entry, one of these is the exit. One of these is right. One of these is left. So now, when I say this, let's say this tuples that are there is nothing but the x and the y values of this point, right? So this entry has two points: point one and point two. So what is the x uh, two and y two? So this is nothing but our x two and y two. Let me change to y, and this is nothing but our x one and y one. So I'm just choosing two points and writing them. Entry has x1, y1, x2, y2. That gives me my one of the interfaces. So I have to define four of them so that I have a square or a rectangle that is complete and that is closed. So that kind of helps me so that I can choose a smaller domain out of the bigger shallow water domain. That is what our CFD uh, shallow water CFD interface file is doing. So now, if I go back to my uh, our manual, I'm trying to connect the manual with the software so that uh, uh, you have you can find a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's happening. If you look at it here, I have defined entry, exit, right, and left, and I have four values here. I mean, probably these values have no meaning in this uh, in the uh, here, but uh, uh, just to give you a general idea of that, there are four values that define the x1, y1, x2, y2. Similarly, my exit has x1, y1, x2, y2. So that kind of gives me what are the different uh, values that are there, uh, and uh, how do we define this kind of a smaller domain from this larger CFD domain? So this uh, smaller domain is like my some uh, buildings in Crescent City in uh, over the larger geoclot domain that con con considers uh, half of the Pacific, right? So that way, I'm kind of uh, Really uh, concisely making a smaller part of it. Okay, so let's go back to our hydro UQ tool and try to see how where this kind of fits in, right? So now if we go back to our hydro UQ tool, so you have a simple thing: upload interface files. So there's a simple CSV file that we are uploading, and where, okay, so that hmm. that's something funny. Okay, I have to see what that is. But okay, uh, that that was not the file that I definitely uploaded. I didn't upload anything. I'm wondering why what happened here. But we will. I'll look at it. But so just upload. We just need to write this small CSV file that has entry, exit, and the four points for each of this small uh, interface that we are choosing. So Hydro UQ is automatically going to take the bathymetry and the shallow water solutions and try to cut everything down and get you the small domain and the you know the what are the solutions at this particular domain. Right. So next thing is the third thing is the building, right? So first thing is we define the bathymetry, which is our big shallow water or the uh, or our big geoclot domain. Second thing is we said, okay, hey, I can't do the big thing with CFD. I need to do a smaller domain. Let me get the smaller domain. How do I say? I define this with uh, like eight, four points and four patches, right? Entry, exit, right and left. Okay. And now then I said, okay, I need to also have, add my buildings in there. But then the interesting thing here is that uh, you might not some somebody might say, "Hey, I don't want to do the building. 
I just want to look at a fluid flow. I'm I'm coming from a background on a different thing. I'm just looking at the indentations. I'm looking at the. I want to look at erosion process and things like that. I don't care about the building. I'm not even going all the way into the coast into the building, but I just want to you know look at the coast with a higher fidelity. Then we don't add any buildings at all. So what hydro UQ will do is it's going to completely ignore the uh, GI information and it's just going to do the fluid simulation. So in a let's say in a crude way, hydro UQ becomes like a front end processor for your open foam simulation, right? It doesn't do the open seas, it doesn't do the Dakota, it just does the open foam. But of course, if we say that hey, no, we want to add a building because that's of interest to us. We are looking at these critical infrastructure. I'm looking at the high rise evacuation structures. I can add buildings here. So there are two ways that the buildings can be added. One is either manually, I can go into the table and try to put something in there. We'll make this table a little bit better uh, so in the next version. Again, like, like I said, again, always it's a work in progress. There's always new ideas. As you give in new ideas, we'll try to keep implementing them. Or I can say, I want to parameterize the building. You know, I want to go and put in there like number of buildings along the coast, into the coast, what the distance of the first building from the coast, what is the distance between these buildings on the side, what is the distance in one behind the other, what is the size of this building, and what is the coordinate of this coastline center, you know. So I can kind of give a parameter, I say I, can, I want to create a 10 by 10 building array, and then I'm also able to automatically hydro UQ will create this for you. And here you can choose different uh, building shapes, of course we just said cuboid, because cuboid is probably the easiest to create and anything more is user defined. And I said that, okay, hey, if it's user defined, just upload a custom STL file. So generally open form always likes STL file. We like STL file, it's really nice to work with. Uh, it's easily readable, writable. Of course, there are different uh, issues with STL files, uh, but you can just upload STL file. For example, we are working with uh, Tori uh, Victoria Johnson at uh, US Naval Academy, who is doing some uh, research with mangrove forests. So building for her would be a mangrove forest. Like, you know, one mangrove tree is a building for her. So this is a complicated, if you think of a mangrove tree, it's a very complicated shape. So we have an STL file that defines this complicated shape and just put in there, I want to have 10 by 10 mangrove trees and automatically Hydro UQ does this for you. It is going to take the, uh, each of these STL files, translate them into the right locations and put them in there so that you don't have to worry about uh, creating them. So like, you know, so parameterized uh, building data in a way. Or, and again, I can choose a simple or a staggered. Simple essentially means one behind the other. The buildings are one behind the other. Staggered essentially means I have a building. Then the next building is, there's no building behind it, but then there's a building, you know, one up in the next row subsequently, right? So basically like, you know, like a staggered configuration or a simply simple configuration of a 10 by 10 array. So, I mean, uh, of course, if you're interested in different kinds of distributions, then please let us know and I'm happy to add them. So we can just kind of create different distribution of buildings so you can do an entire array. But again, like I said, the biggest uh, trick here is it does only one building on which you can get the response. So what is it going to do here, for example, is that it's going to try to find the nearest building that you have defined in the GI. So in the GI, you have given some coordinate of latitude and longitude, and it is going to try to find what is the nearest building in this array of, let's say 10 by 10, that is nearest to this latitude and longitude, and it's going to assign that as the response building, right? So you, we need to be careful in what information we are giving here so that we get the right response building, but Hydro UQ just automatically searches this for you so that you don't have to uh, go and mark it out yourself. Uh, on the contrary, you can also add the building in a manual manner. So when you add it in a manual manner, I can say like add building or remove building here. I select it and I can remove building. Uh, I thought, uh, when, when I was building, it looked fun, but then when, when I was using, then I realized it's super cumbersome to use. Uh, that's again, like I said, right? So when you're developing, you feel this is a fantastic thing, and then you start to find faults in it. So that's a, that's a, I feel it's a good thing to find faults in it. It always helps it make better. So if you go to the manual, there are uh, four kinds of buildings that are at the moment allocated. So this is something, again, uh, uh, that needs to be changed, that, that will be updated as we go on to make it more user friendly for you. So let's go back to the manual here again. So now if I go to the manual, uh, let's be take. So if we go to again the geometry, the buildings of specimens. So again, it basically explains all of these things. So there are four building types. So minus two, minus one, one and two. So there are building codes. I think we'll replace this by a drop-down menu or something that makes it easier for you to select these building types. 
So anything less than zero is a saying that I want to have a building on which this is the building on which I want to get the response. And anything greater than zero is like all the other buildings around your building of interest. Okay. So when, when I say uh, plus one, uh, and one thing important to note here is that it only supports uh, one building on which you can get the response, right? So if you add multiple buildings with like minus one or minus two uh, as a tie, then it is going to give you an error saying that, hey, you have defined too many buildings on which you want response. You're asking for too much, right? So go to a user forum and tell the developer to add it in there. I don't have it in there, right? Uh, so you can define only one building with a type less than zero, but you can have any number of buildings with type greater than zero. So what is this uh, less than zero and greater than zero again, right? So and uh, in uh, when I say minus two, the building definition is taken from the general information. So I already given some information in the general information from where I'm going to take this information. But when I say it's minus one, then what is going to happen, it is you can uh, give an STL file. And it is going to use this STL file to define the geometry of the building. If you remember, let me just share the entire screen so I can kind of put it one by one beside the other and we can have a look at this uh, side by side. Um, Okay, where did my share button go? Okay. Okay, so this is what we were looking at, right? So can you see my screen with the Hydro UQ? Please let me know if you're not able to see. Uh, yeah, so we have a type here. So it's, it can be minus one, minus two, plus one, plus two. Uh, I think this is a very cumbersome thing. I'll replace this with like a drop down menu, but for now we have this. So minus two essentially says that my information about this building is going, is you already have given it in a general information, take it from there. You know, you, I don't want to define multiple times, so take it from there and you know, build your, build a cube with it. Now, instead, if I give minus one, essentially what would happen is you need to upload a STL file, right? So you're essentially like, we were talking about the mangrove forest. So this is the mangrove forest, like any complicated building geometry, maybe you're doing a bridge pair, right? Or, uh, you know, so then you might want to use this STL file to upload it rather than using a simple cube or a cuboid thing that we are generating. So minus two would just generate a cuboid, minus one would uh, use the complicated geometry that you are giving in order to put a building in there. Similarly, plus one uh, would essentially, uh, let me just be sure of what I'm saying here, right? So plus one would essentially again create a cube or a cuboid and this is the other building on which you don't want a structural response. But similarly, when you give a two here, essentially that will, you can use a STL file to create the other buildings as well, right? So there are two combinations here. Use a STL file or get a cube as your building. And do you want a response on this building or do you not want a response on this building? So if you want a response on this building, then your type is always less than zero. If you want, don't want a response, if it's just other buildings influencing the flow, then your type is greater than zero. Right, and uh, depending on minus two, minus one, plus two, plus one, you're either having a cube or you're having a STL file. Okay, and uh, then what you need to give is a center, which is the x comma y comma z. So this is essentially the center of the bottom surface of your building, so that I can move your building to the right location. What is the latitude and longitude? But maybe I also want the height of the uh, where you're locating this thing, right? So uh, because I need to move it in the x y z space to the right location, so that I can have the floors around it. So the parameters essentially are either length, breadth, L, B, and H, or you just leave it empty if it's an STL file. Okay. So, and then essentially what we have, uh, once we have defined the buildings, so that is uh, essentially the uh, entire geometric definition we have. So we have defined what the bathymetry is. So we have defined the ocean floor. So automatically what it is going to, hydro UQ is going to do, it is going to create your box with the floor as the ocean, uh, with the bottom as your ocean floor. So we always think of it a higher CFD simulation, at least in this context of the external flows as in a box. So you always have an entry, you have an exit, you have a bottom, you have a top, you have a right and a left, right? So these are the patches on which I'm giving some kind of a boundary condition. And essentially uh, you're just defining the bottom surface, but Hydro UQ does the rest of it to fit you the, all the other patches as well. Automatically give you the uh, closed STL file with everything else. Okay, 
the second thing is the uh, interface which we basically took a big geocla domain and made it into a smaller domain lastly we have some buildings in here which we are basically adding to under, around which we want to get the structural response okay so next thing is essentially we once we have defined our uh, uh, geometry we want to do a meshing so there are three kinds of meshing available here one is the hydro uq measure so this is nothing but a, a simple uh, meshing that we uh, do and uh, this is let's say something that is particularly mostly for beginners who are just starting out in there rather than for somebody who is more advanced as uh, such so if you are more advanced you might want to use some kind of a external uh, pre processing software because there are already a lot of these tools that are available that that are really well developed and the kind of developing this thing again from scratch don't, doesn't make much sense but you can use fluent or gambit or gmesh and do a mesh and what we will do is we automatically will convert this into an open foam mesh format so you just have to select let's say fluent and upload the fluent files and it will automatically convert it into open foam mesh whenever it is required right so whenever we do a mesh we will not do the our meshing but we will basically use this in order to create the open foam mesh alternatively there's something called of uh, open foam sol um, mesh dictionary so this is called a block mesh dict and the snappy hex mesh dict so you can either use you can upload both either one or both of these mesh dictionaries and what we will do is we will basically use these mesh dictionaries in order to do the meshing so for example when you specify a hydro uq mesher depending on the fineness and the regional refinements what you are doing is you are essentially um the hydro uq is going to create a mesh dictionary that we used with open foam to create these uh, meshes but if you i have your own mesh dictionary then you can directly use that right so the rest of the things are uh, i think we probably have uh, running out of time I'll, uh, but we'll try to finish everything in detail at least today so that we can run these things tomorrow so last thing is the material so we have a air and a water and we have a surface interaction between them so there is a parameter for the surface tension between air and water and rest of them are standard properties like kinematic viscosity density of air and water as such right so the initial uh, i'll come back to the initial and the boundary condition at the last uh, so the last is uh, one thing is a solver so this is your simulation time what do what are the times do i want to simulate what's the start time what's the end time that i want to simulate and uh, i think probably in the next version i'll try to get the start and end time directly from your geocla files in order to populate them but at the moment it does not automatically update so you have to manually provide this information and uh, generally the two important things to think about is one is the time interval and the write intervals so the time intervals for these cfd simulations are generally very small 10 to power minus 5 minus 6 are really common and you don't want to write out your solutions so what is the time interval is your delta t increment right and write interval is every time at which it's going to write out the solution files so generally a good uh, measure is to think about writing every 100 or every 1000 step uh, you might not want to write out every step unless you are trying to do a testing for 5 or 10 step because you'll uh, very soon kind of try to automatically get like a huge amount of data that you will have a hard time dealing with right so that's the right interval and last thing you have something called a restart on a restart on for example i might have already run a simulation and i don't want to do the simulation again you know like i might say okay hey uh, let me take the first 100 steps and let me start again from the 101st step okay and then you can just upload these restart files to so upload the uh, diction, uh, the files that you have from the open foam and it's automatically going to start from wherever you had left off okay last thing is uh, these don't have any other options at the moment called domain decomposition so when we want to run it in parallel this is something very important to make sure that you you want to take your domain and try to decompose into smaller pieces right so each of these smaller pieces goes to a different processor so we have uh, using the standard scotch uh, decomposition method that is available in open foam and you can give the number of subdomains you want to divide into like for example we can go up to 60 to uh, number let's say like you know we can go up to like let's say uh, 62 domains if you are using one node and it is going to make take your domain and like or this cube which we had built and chop it into 62 pieces and the scotch method does it such that the number of um, processor to processor communication is minimized so that our efficiency on parallelization is uh, as high as possible okay 
and uh, last thing is the post processing essentially there is no post processing which means no fluid this uh, primary related to the event or the fluid part of the post processing so we need to get these file directly from design safe and we won't be able to get them uh, here and so or for if you want to do a post processing we want to give a set of points uh, most often when we do some experiments we want to extract the velocities and pressures because we have these pressure and velocity gauges at some places and we can just upload a csv file of the points at which we want to extract this velocity and pressure and hydro uq will automatically uh, uh, get these things and put it out for you so you can work with it right so the last two things are the initial phase and the boundary conditions is something that we have left off we have not yet prescribed in here so you know, when you use a shallow water solver automatically the initial condition is specified here initial condition for a phase is essentially saying where is my water right i have this big box with both air and water which part of this is air which part of this is water right so if we were to just uh, write a drawing there let's try to draw it and try to understand this right so where did my drawing go yeah there it is i don't have face id so okay so yeah there it is now so now let's try to see initial condition so right so we have this big box in here so uh, right so let me try to draw a wave flume of a 2d wave say let's say i'm drawing a 2d dimensions now let's say i have some buildings in here and now i want to say where is my water and where is my air because the cfd does uh, software only knows there's a mesh it knows that we have air and water and you know these are the properties but we doesn't still know where is the water initially right so now maybe maybe i want to just fill this uh, up to here with water right so maybe let's say so i can't fill up to here maybe that's too much so let's say i want to fill this part with water so what am i going to do is i'm going to specify right a box let's say i'm going to specify a box in which it is going to fill this with water right so same thing i'm just going to extend in the third direction as well so it's going to fill this box with water this box need not completely conform to the geometry that we have but we can uh, uh, kind of say, say so we have to give a point one which is the lowermost point and a point two which is the uppermost point so this is basically we give the x one y one z one and x two y two and z two so once we are able to give these two points it's automatically going to define a box and say this box contains water so what it's going to do is like let's say we had this uh, our uh, domain was basically split into a mesh right so what is going to do is basically here it says is air so it's going to define an alpha value of 0 so alpha represents somehow how much water and how much air is there so now let's say this cell has only water it is going to define a value of 1 now maybe this intermediate cell here let's say if you look at it maybe there you know there's some water some air and some water right so it's going to use a volume of fraction method is what we are using we are using a volume of fraction method and it is going to define an alpha value for this cell that is between 1 and 0 so this is let's say the cut cell okay mixed cell or something like let me not confuse with other things but so this uh, it's a, right and so it's either it's a zero or if it's zero then this cell only has air if it's one this only has water so right so it's it's going to use an alpha value and that's what we are doing here initially we are saying these cells that are in this particular box cuboid defined by p1 and p2 is essentially water so it's going to automatically go and try to find hey cell number 1 are you in this box no you are what yeah cell number 2 are you in this box yes okay your alpha value is 1 you have water so that's what it's going to do it's going to go to each cell and kind of define if it has water or if it has air in a way so that way uh, the solver knows where the water is and where the air is right so if i apply some kind of a forcing function or boundary condition then the then it knows what needs to be done in this regard right 
So last thing that is there, probably I think we should have put a little more time, I should have put a little more time into it, is the boundary condition. So that's something that's very critical that we have to look at the boundary condition itself. Uh, maybe I can take an F, uh, five to 10 extra minutes on of your lunch if that's okay. And uh, so we'll try to finish, at least briefly look at the boundary conditions. So we are all set, at least we know what's happening in there and uh, we should be able to play with the uh, simulations tomorrow morning when we have our first lab session there. So there, uh, there are as an add and a remove boundary condition and it's going to remove the boundary condition, right? So it's going to add a patch or remove a patch. So first thing is I want to give a boundary patch name. This has nothing to do with anything except this is for identifier for me. So this does nothing except that says that, okay, I mean, for me to remember, I can just leave it as patch zero and, and uh, it won't care about it, right? So now there are three things. So uh, at the moment there's patch location, we have kept it a standard. We also want to bring in mesh, mesh based and things like that where you can select uh, some particular patches and so on. But for now it's only standard and only option. So then you have six of these. Now, if you remember, we were talking about this. We said exit, entry, exit, right and left, right? So entry is where I'm standing from where the fluid is flowing in. Exit is where it's going out. Probably right and left is you know, to the right and to the left of it. This is just my assumption. Right? Maybe you can also do the opposite way. You know, you can have the fluid coming in from the exit. Nobody cares. It's just a convention to think about, right? So, and then top and bottom. Bottom is the ground, the floor of the ocean, and top is the atmosphere. Okay, so we can define, we, uh, ideally it's best to define six boundary conditions for each of these. And uh, automatically the boundary condition for the building would be a no slip uh, boundary condition. So there are uh, several boundary condition. One is the general shallow water solutions. So now if you try to say, uh, say that I want my simulation type needs to be a shallow water uh, CFD, uh, let's say a resolution of a shallow water thing, and you don't select any uh, boundary that has a shallow water solutions as your boundary condition, it is going to give you an error. So you have to have at least one boundary that has a shallow water solution as a boundary condition. And uh, other, second, other things are the three kinds of inlets. One is a constant velocity. So where you can say, okay, there's a velocity is constant, uh, constant velocity input. Or you can say that there's a moving wall OSU flume or a general flume. So what is this difference between OSU flume and a general flume? But we'll try to uh, talk about this boundary condition tomorrow morning in the session. That's where we have the wave flume thing. So there are two types of input condition that are required for the flume. And that is what we'll be talking about tomorrow. And uh, there are other velocity boundary condition like zero gradient or inlet outlet and a wall slip. So even if, whenever you're in doubt, leave it as a zero gradient always is a good thing or inlet outlet is always a good thing for an outlet. Uh, wall slip, essentially no slip says that it's like a wall where the velocity at the wall is zero. Essentially, that, that's the kind of boundary condition you're putting in there. Uh, there are two, uh, for example, when we are doing structural mechanics there, are, we are solving primarily for uh, displacements. So you're, when you look at your finite element solver in a, with a structural mechanics context, you applied, you get displacements. But here we are solving primarily for uh, uh, velocities and pressure. And so uh, one of the, oh, sorry, there was a question, I kind of missed it. Yeah, is there an option to extract forces in addition to velocities and pressure? Yeah, I'll come to that uh, before the end of the uh, lecture. So, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yes, there's, there's, there's an option and that's what exactly open form is doing. Uh, that's what hydro UQ is doing essentially to say. Uh, so there are two, um, uh, uh, let's say two um, variables. One is the velocity and one is the pressure. We are solving for these. And uh, we need to not just specify the velocities. Like for example, what are we doing? We are essentially solving a partial differential equation, which is nothing but Navier-Stokes equation. Right? So we need to give some initial conditions and some boundary conditions for the unknown variables. So uh, we have given a velocity, but what about the pressure? So generally I have put it something called a default choice. This is like a safe option, for, especially for if you're a beginner and you, know, you don't know what to choose there, then it's a safe option. What hydro UQ does is depending on your kind of velocity boundary condition that you're doing and the kind of simulation you're doing, it's not any AI, but it's just a set of if-else conditions it will choose some particular pressure um, boundary condition that I think will probably work well. I mean, I'm not saying that it's going, it's a perfect boundary condition, but it, I think that it's probably not going to let it 
crash at least, right? I mean, uh, you will not get a cryptic uh, crash message. And that's that's what I'm trying to do here, trying to set a appropriate pressure boundary condition that might be suitable for these kind of velocity boundary conditions that, uh, that are there. So essentially, you, uh, if, you, if you do not know what you need to do, just leave it as a default choice. Or for example, there's a zero gradient or like a fixed value, which is essentially saying it's a particular value. Now, uh, if you would like to add more boundary conditions in there, again, come back to the forum and just write there or come back to the office hours and say, hey, I'm trying to do this kind of a work and I would like to see if this can be added in there. And this is no time. We can easily add a lot of them in there. Like uh, it, it takes no time to add these things to it, right? So generally you need to define six of the boundary condition, at least for all the six patches. So every time, let's say, for example, okay, I add a, any patch. Now I select this as entry. Now I add a next patch then I have to select no, next one maybe may not be exit, but could be a top, you know. So we need to at least define six boundary conditions for the six patches so that CFD simulation can run uh, reasonably seamlessly. Okay, uh, so I think we are pretty much, I'm already uh, ahead of time. I mean, I've already taken like five, six minutes extra there, but uh, yeah. So just to address the last, uh, so this is essentially like entire workflow of the um, CFD simulation. So what we will be doing tomorrow in the first class is also to look at the bathymetry, particularly for the wave flume. Uh, for example, many of you might be using a wave flume facility to do some experiments in there. It need not necessarily be the Oregon wave flume, but you might have your own wave flume in your university, or you might be using it somewhere else, have some collaborations and so on. And that's where the digital wave flume comes into a very nice thing where you can define the bathymetry. Uh, for example, if you would like to add your own wave flume, let me know and I would be happy to help you with it. For example, let's say there's a standard OSU wave flume. You select it, done. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to uh, talk anything about the uh, geometry, except for example, you probably have to give your building data because you are you want to be have you want to know where to keep the building data, but you can just select the OSU flume. And this helps you to design these experiments before you actually go into the experimental facility and try to use them because it takes several it takes uh, several weeks of setup to get an experiment set up. Uh, instead, you can run these simulations and try to have an idea. Okay, yeah, maybe I want to do this thing. I don't want to do this thing. And you get you design your experiments very intelligently by using this without much of an effort. So, for example, you can use a standard OSU flume, and all you need to give is a boundary condition here and say. Hey, I want to use the OSU flume. Okay, or I want to use a, a general flume boundary condition. And then there are two uh, inputs that are coming into it. We will talk about in detail what these inputs are and what the files look like. And uh, for example, this file for the OSU flume is something that you get from the experimental facility. So when you run an experiment, these are files that they generate and you just bring them, black, close your eyes and just put into hydro UQ, hydro UQ parses it and does all the rest of the setup, sets up the boundary condition for you so that you don't have to worry about it. So we will talk about this and what format it is in, in tomorrow's uh, class or tomorrow's lecture and we'll try to run some simulations as well. Uh, with that, I would, I think I would try to like to, I would uh, close this session here. Uh, so if somebody is interested, uh, if they have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. I think there was one question, is there an option to extract forces, right? So before I leave, I will probably show you this thing as well. So let's, let's try to see how to, ex what's happening here, right? So let me just share the entire screen so I can show you uh, two things. Um, please bear with me for a, couple more minutes and uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Uh, if you have a question, please put in chat or just uh, uh, unmute yourself to ask. And so here essentially, let's say when I say uh, post processing, this is essentially the post processing for the fluid part only. Now, when you're talking about forces, you want to get these forces on your particular buildings. So if you define a building of interest, or let's say you can just define a wall there, right? So then these, this is where we, we, we are extracting the forces. So now let's say, I, how do I get this data, right? So one thing is I go to get from design safe. Oh, oh sorry, I must log in, I didn't log in again. Okay, let me log in here. In the meantime, I can go to design safe. Okay, I'm logged in. So let me say get from design safe. So now this was something that I ran yesterday night. I mean, I was just trying to play with it. Like you see, see I have all these files at the end of it because 
whenever I added a fight, it was working. When I didn't add a fight, it didn't work. You know, I mean, I mean, I did a mistake. So not, nothing to do with the fight. I mean, just just trying to. Uh, so now, whenever when I say retrieve data here. It is trying to get the structural response. Essentially, the force and what's happening with the structure in there. Uh, okay. So, and this is essentially what you get the data values. You can, uh, I think, uh, Sangri and Akash and Swanchi would go into detail of what these forces mean and uh, in the physical idea of things. But then there's another way to extract it. So, let's go back to again get from design safe, right? So, now if I look at the ID here, the ID starts as 7962EEA6 or something. I hope you're able to see. If you're not able to see, let me know. So I can just share that window uh, and you'll be able to see it more clearly. So now let me go to my design safe account and log in here. Okay. So, and then I'll go to my workspace and data depot. There will be a folder called archive. So that is where the, all the jobs are being archived in a way. I think uh, uh, so, right? So, and uh, then inside that, there's a folder called jobs. And inside that, we should be able to find this cryptic 7962EEA6. So basically, this is arranged as job dash something. And this dash something that is there is the same thing that you have here. So it starts from zero, one, two, three, nine, and then goes to A, B, C, D, E. So that kind of uh, is easier to search. So we have here something like seven, nine, six, two. So let's go to seven. So you can see six, then seven, seven, nine, six, two, E, E, A, six, right? So that kind of helps you to easily connect. Otherwise you have to look at the uh, date and time. And unfortunately, very weirdly, uh, Design Safe does not allow you to arrange your files or rearrange or sort your files by date and time with a really weird thing. So this kind of helps you to really find what you're uh, running easily. So let me open this file. So Hydro UQ has uh, 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 generated these files. Anything related to the open sea. So we said that what Hydro UQ is doing, you have run these simulations on this patch called buildings, which is essentially the building of interest for us. We'll talk about this tomorrow on this patch called building because I wanted Quanchi and I mean Akash to introduce the UQ before I go into it. On this patch, we are getting the forces. We are calculating the forces and we are extracting it to, into a post-processing folder. So if, we, if you look at this uh, evt files.tar.gz, here we can kind of, uh, you can download it. I mean, I have deleted a lot of folders out there. Like for example, all the CFD folders because it would uh, accumulate a lot of size and left out only uh, things that are uh, important to us. Let me open this thing here. Okay. So we have EVT. So if we have, you have all the case files, O0, so constant, and the system are the case files related for your open form simulation. So for example, here is a STL file that was there. For example, in the constant price surface folder, here you can find all the STL files that have been used. For example, a building and uh, the 660 STL file that's entry, exit, top, bottom, right, left. We'll see about, uh, or talk, talk about how to create this STL file tomorrow and what format they need to be in. So that is something, an action item for tomorrow. And then there's a folder called post-processing. So I just uh, unzip this evt files.tar.gc. There we have this where we have post-processing. There you can find the building forces. So you can find whatever uh, building you have defined as your building of interest, all the forces are available in this thing. So let me just open in this. Uh, yeah. So. so you can see what are the forces at each time step. So this was just run for three time step. I was testing something. So you can see what are the forces at uh, each of these time step that you're getting in there. Okay. So at, you, forces bins also gives you the forces for different stories as well. And so you can extract these, these this information is already there. Uh, from the Hydro UQ in this folder, but you just need to access it directly from Design Safe portal and download its zip file. So everything has been zipped because uh, what Design Safe does is it takes from the stampede and copies every single file with a single uh, uh, copy command, which can be really slow. If, if we will see that something called archiving, when you look, check the status of your job, you'll see uh, in queue, which means it's waiting to get started. 
running, which means it has started to run and you know, simulations are progressing. Then you have uh, archiving, which means everything is done. It is copying all the folder to this archive folder. So there design safe takes one file at a time and does it, you know, so when you have like a zillion files with open form, this will take eternity. So that's the reason I'm zipping all of it. So then it's only one file for design safe to copy and then it's done in a, in a jiffy, right? So we just need to download it if we want to have a look at it. And uh, similarly, there's a .err uh, file here and a .out file. So this is, these are the two files where you can find out what are the errors that you are getting. So if you look at the ERR file, it basically has a list of all the commands that we are running essentially. You can see that OpenCC is being run here. So all the outputs are coming out here. Similarly, there's this out file also where all the, uh, I think there's a lot of these print, a uh, lot of these commands that we are running and the print statements that we are doing, everything is coming out here, right? So these are the two files, for example, here you can see uh, loading modules on Stampede. So we need to load OpenFoam, load or Dakota, uh, then translating the building STL file. So we take the STL file and move it to the location where the building should be. Then combining STL files, block mesh. So we are meshing here, surface feature extract, snappy hex mesh, we check the mesh. Then we also when decomposing the domain to run it in parallel, then starting the CFD simulation, starting Dakota. So you can see that, for example, you, if you open this file, you'll see that there's an error somewhere and you know exactly where it has stopped. So that is the easy way to debug and uh, let us know. So for example, we get a cryptic, when I was working with the people from the wind, uh, people used to write on the forum and say, hey, my CFD simulation is not running. Okay, that's a nice thing, but what happened? Where did you stop? Can you share the files with us? So if, you, if something doesn't run, just go to design safe. And if you can share these files with us, that would be really, really helpful to help you. Because we want to help you we don't want to go back and forth, get me this file, get me that file and frustrate you. So please go to design save, go to archive, you know how to find the job number and you know how to find the particular folder. Just download all these files and just send it to me on the forum. Okay, so now if it's something like a very important thing that you don't want to share in public, you can probably put it on your Google Drive or something. Just give me a share permission you know, to look at it for now. And then you can always remove this permission later once I have looked at this file so that uh, now, you know, we don't, we, we don't want you to share something confidential in the in the public domain as well. So unless you, if, you, if you share these files, it's easier for us to debug and understand what error is there and how do we uh, get stuff from there. So that's how you can extract the pressure and velocity, pressure and uh, sorry, extract the forces. It's already there and you can easily look at it. So if you look at this TIM, uh, TMP folder, this essentially has all the uh, Dakota.json. So this was what I was saying. So this is essentially nothing but your input file. So today we never talked about how do I read an input file into Hydro UQ. There's something on open and save. We never talked about that. So we'll try to do that tomorrow morning. So this is essentially whatever was there in our UI, whatever we chose there is put into this Dakota format uh, from where, you know, uh, uh, Stampede is, and, uh, is reading and trying to run your simulations as well. So everything else comes out also in this folder. There are a lot of other files that are subsequently uh, written and uh, done in there. Okay, so that, that's one way to access your folders and uh, see what's happening in your CFD simulations and uh, uh, try to get some idea of it. Uh, uh, but if you have any other questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I can stay back and uh, uh, happy to help you with it. I mean, I hope you got a general idea of the, what the Hydro UQ tool is, what are the different features, how to create these files. And uh, most of this thing is already in the documentation. That's why I was trying to connect that, hey, this thing is here in its documentation so that you know to make a one-to-one -one connection in there. Uh, but uh, in, in case you have any questions, just write to us and we are very, very happy to answer there. And we are very happy to help you. Uh, we don't want you to get stuck for 24 hours or something. We'll try to uh, give as quick a response, probably, if we needed us, we'll have a Zoom call and help you with it, right? So 